All aboard. These are the stories of seven women born in the 19th century who worked hard to become scientists and published pioneering works in their fields. These women have been largely forgotten and this is a journey in time and space to meet and remember them. The journey begins in the second half of the 18th century in St. Petersburg. In the city of St. Petersburg, in the laboratory of the Department of Physiology directed by Ivan Romanovich Tarkanov, a series of experiments in animal models highlighted the importance of sleeping. Maria Mikhailovna Korkunova was one of the first women who graduated in medicine in Russia and probably in the whole Europe. Her major contribution to neuroscience has been a very influential work on sleep deprivation. She travelled in many European countries to present the results of her studies and she published articles and books in French, English and German, in addition to Russian language. The Tsar Alexander III established for her a lifelong pension and his son, Tsar Nikolai II, gave her a bonus of 10,000 rubles that was an enormous amount of money for that time. Maria Mikhailovna Korkunova was born in 1843. Her father, Mikhail Andreevich Korkunov, was a well-known historian and archaeologist. While still a student, she married Poniatowski, and they both participated to revolutionary circles. For this activity, her husband was arrested and died shortly after that. She remarried in 1865 to Vyacheslav Aksientevich Manasein, who will become later a prominent personality in the medical field in Russia. In 1870-71, Anasina Karkunova spent several months at the Polytechnic Institute in Vienna, working with Julius Wiesner. There, she studied the process of alcoholic fermentation and made the seminal discovery that fermentation is due to specific components that can be isolated from mere cells. She called them unorganized enzymes. These results confirmed the chemical hypothesis of fermentation proposed by Claude Bernard and Justus Liebig rather than the Louis Pasteur's physiological hypothesis. It took more than 25 years for the German chemist Eduard Buchner to replicate these results and although he was aware of Manasena Karkunova's work, he did not credit her. For this discovery, Buchner received the Nobel Prize in 1907 and Manasena's name was completely forgotten. After coming back from Vienna, she started working with Ivan Romanovich Tarkanov. She soon left Manasin for him, although she never legally divorced from her husband. In the physiology lab, Manasina Karkunova conducted her investigation on sleep deprivation on puppies. The experiment consisted in forcing the puppies to stay completely awake, although they had access to food and care, the total sleep deprivation was fatal after 4-5 days and the puppies could not be rescued. For a comparison, dogs could be kept in complete starvation for 20-25 days and still be rescued by food administration after this time. This demonstrated that sleep was more critically necessary than food for survival. Minocin and pioneering experiments had a huge impact on subsequent sleep studies in animal models and humans. Her book Sleep as One Third of Human Life, Its Physiology, Pathology, Hygiene and Psychology, published in English in 1897, was considered the sleep encyclopedia at that time, translated in various languages and distributed in most of European countries. She enhanced the importance of sleep as a particular state of the brain activity, rather than the absence of activity as it was commonly seen at the time. 
this was a remarkable intuition, considering that the electron shuffleogram did not exist yet. In her words, sleep is necessary as nutrition and reconstitution of the cerebral tissue. And she added that Byron was certainly right when he said that our life is composed of two distinct existences, for sleep is a world apart. Our life is twofold, sleep has its own world, a boundary between the things misnamed, death and existence. Sleep has its own world. Around the 1890s, Manasena Karkunova was invited to give public lectures in auditoriums in Soliani Gorodok, a neighborhood of St. Petersburg, on topics related to psychology, brain physiology, and especially pedagogy, and the attendance was always very high. She died in St. Petersburg on the 17th of March, 1903. The journey continues to Paris at the Hôpital de la Salpêtrière in the laboratory of Joseph Jules de Gélin, covered wall to wall with neuroanatomical illustrations. The Hôpital de la Salpêtrière was built in the 17th century and gained recognition in the 18th and 19th centuries for its advancements in the treatment of psychiatric and neurological disorders. Augusta de Gérin Klunk was the first woman to obtain an internship in a Parisian hospital and the first woman to become president of the Société de Neurologie de Paris. She was an exceptional physician, neurologist and neuroanatomist. She received the Anatomy Prize of Free Teaching in 1878-1879, the Gordon Award of the Academy of Medicine in 1886, the Silver Medal at the Paris Faculty of Medicine and the L'Allemagne Award of the prestigious Academy of Sciences for the doctoral thesis in 1890, the first Legion of Honor for her scientific studies in 1913, and the second Legion of Honor with the rank of officer for her extensive work in treating wounded soldiers during the war in 1921. She was the first woman to become president of the French Society of Neurology in 1914. Auguste Marie Klumk was born on the 15th of October 1859 in San Francisco, USA, to John Gerard Klumk and Dorothea Matilda Toll. She was the second of six children. In 1871, after divorcing from Joan, Dorothea Toll embarked to Europe with her six children. They lived together with Dorothea's cousin in Göttingen. Dorothea strongly influenced the future of her children. She encouraged Augusta to become a physician. Augusta Klumk was admitted to medical school in Paris in 1877. Her professor of anatomy, Ford, suggested her to apply for an externship at the hospitals in Paris to start a clinical career. Her application was rejected because the male medical students were not authorized to apply for an externship or internship of the Paris hospitals. Thanks to the feminist campaigns, Klumpk became an extern at l'Hôpital de Luxine in 1882 with another woman, Blanche Edouard, a member of the French feminist movement. In the experimental pathology laboratory directed by Professor Vulpien, she described for the first time a type of palsy due to the injury of the lower braids of the brachial plexus that carries her name, Klumpk palsy. In 1888, she married the well-known neurologist Joseph Jules de Gérin. Augusta de Gérin Klumk, together with her husband, wrote the two volume book Anatomy of the Central Nervous System, a great classic of neurology and a considerable achievement in human neuroanatomy. In the book, both normal and pathological anatomy of the nervous system are described there is a detailed histology of brains sliced into horizontal, parasagittal, coronal and oblique sections. In 1891, Auguste and Joseph de Gérin had a daughter, 
Ibon, there also became a well-known neurologist. In July 1908, at the Société de Neurologie of Paris, a three-day scientific duel took place between Jules Desjardins and Pierre-Marie, Charcot's pupil. Desjardins advocated a classical and systematic classification of aphasia. Marie claimed that there was only one type of aphasia, a posterior aphasia. Auguste de Chirin Klumk demonstrated that Marie assumptions were wrong. Thanks to her lesson of anatomy at the Phaser Congress in 1910, de got the position of Chair of Clinical Neurology at the Salpetri Hospital. De Chirin Klumk continued to work as a scientist and as a physician. During World War I, she worked at the Salpetri and later Les Invalides a military hospital where wounded soldiers with spinal cord injuries were treated. She created a vocational rehabilitation centre near Fontainebleau. She observed in a patient's a condition, which she called parasthrophy, that consists in the growth of the ectopic bone tissue in the injured soft tissues around the joints. This condition, now known as heterotopic ossification, often limits the patient's rehabilitation. Augusta de Chirin Klumk died on the 5th of November 1927 and was buried next to her husband in Paris at the Père Lachaise churchyard. In 2016, the collection of the De Chirin Foundation that Augusta de Chirin Klumk inaugurated after her husband's death has been moved to the basement of Tussauds University and is no longer open to the public. We hope that this archive will soon be accessible to everyone, thus continuing to inspire future neuroscientists. From Paris, we move about 60 kilometers north to visit Clermont, in the region of Picardy. At the asylum for mentally ill, the place she called the Penal Colony for Psychiatrists, Constance Pascal had plans to reform the institutional medicine. She was the first psychiatrist woman in France. Her huge contribution to psychiatry is largely forgotten. She prohibited corporal punishment and straitjackets for mentally ill. She ensured clean dormitories and she was interested in educating children with severe learning difficulties. Costanza Pascal was born on the 22nd of August 1877 in Pigest, in the province of Wallachia, Romania. Her father, Ayn Pascal, was a landowner. Her brother, Tarajan, was encouraged to pursue a military career, but Costanza was not allowed to continue her studies. After the death of her father in 1891, she obtained from her family the permission to pursue a professional qualification. In 1897, she moved to Paris to start her medical training with minimal financial support. In 1903, Costanza Pascal and Medellin Pelletier were the first two women to be accepted as asylum interns. During her internship, Pascal was at the Ville Edvard under Paul Serrier. Her 1905 dissertation, Femmes atypiques de la paralysie générale, supervised by Sérieux, gained the highest mark, a bronze medal from the medical faculty, and in 1906, the prestigious Moreau de Tue Prize. The thesis was reported in the press as a feminine success. After gaining the French citizenship in 1907, Constance Pascal was eligible to take the examination for a permanent psychiatric post, and she passed in 1908. It was the first time for a woman. Pascal was assigned as junior doctor to the asylum of Clermont de Loire, where she remained until 1920. In 1908, she published an article on Robert Schumann, contributing to the debate about his mental illness. Schumann suffered two distinct mental disorders. But his musical genius was the result of perfect mental functioning, affirming that his genius emerges not because of a mental disability, but in spite of it. Pascal opposed the Lombroso's theory of the mad genius. 
In 1911, she published an analytical summation of previously published research on the membership recogs from nosology and organic basis to social aspects. Pascal noted its effect especially on the young and traced the social and educational dimensions of the disease. By 1918, schizophrenia was adopted as the alternative diagnostic term for the disease. Pascal corresponded with Kreplin, who even offered her a collaboration with him. Her reform plans were stopped by the outbreak of World War I. Clermont was occupied by the Germans in 1914. Patients were not evacuated. In terrible conditions of food deprivation and hygiene, the asylum admitted also shell-shocked soldiers. In 1915, Constance Pascal met General Justin Mengin, commander of the 6th Army Brigade, who had been quartered at El Clermont. His wife was suffering mental health problems. By the end of the year, she discovered she was pregnant, and this posed a great risk for her career. She did not reveal her condition and obtained a leave for health problems on the 1st of April 1916. On the 17th of July 1916, she gave birth to her daughter, Jeanne, who was recorded with no surname as daughter of unnamed father and mother. She was officially an orphan and she received her mother's surname when formally adopted in 1924. After one month, Pascal returned to Clermont, but she soon arranged a temporary transfer to a section of the Charenton Asylum on the outskirts of Paris. Here, she fostered a daughter with the help of a friend, John Stryker, and the chairman, Mengin. In 1923, after being appointed chief physician at chalon sur marne she established one of the first institutions, Medical Pédagogiques, to give education and medical assistance to children under 16 years of age. In 1928, Constance Pascal was diagnosed with breast cancer and she underwent a mastectomy, but she was not free from recurrence from then on. She died of cancer on the 21st of December 1937 at Maison Blanche with medical attendants and her daughter being present. She had asked for no commemoration in the psychiatric press. In all of her life, she maintained a strong separation between professional and private worlds. To achieve her professional goals required exceptional inner strength and courage. From Paris, we moved to London. The Regent's University buildings in Regent Park were originally built for the new Bedford College after it was moved from Bedford Square in 1874 and from York Place, Baker Street in 1913. Bedford College was founded in 1849 by Elizabeth Jester Reed and it was the first higher education institution for women in the United Kingdom. Here, Beatrice Sedgill established one of the first laboratories of experimental psychology in the United Kingdom, after studying with Owen Scoop at the University of Würzburg, where she was the first woman to receive a PhD. Since 2006, the Faculty of Human Sciences at the University of Würzburg assigns the Beatrice Sedgill Award to a young female researcher in memory of a pioneer of women's emancipation. Beatrice Edgill was born on the 26th of October 1871 in Dukesbury, Gloucestershire. She learned how to read at the age of nine. She was the first British woman to earn a doctorate in psychology and later became the first female professor of psychology in the United Kingdom. As it was reported in the Westminster Gazette on the 11th of February 1927, she was pioneering on entirely new academic ground. From that small beginning has grown the comprehensive psychology department with its splendidly equipped laboratories and lecture rooms. In 1930, Edgar became the first woman president of the Aristotelian Society. From 1930 to 1932, she was the first woman president of the British Psychological Society. In 1932, she was the first woman to be elected president of the psychological section of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. 
Her first grant to set up a laboratory at Bedford College was five pounds. Not much, even for the early 19s. Those were the days of makeshift and poverty, in Edgar's words. In the psychological laboratory of the University of London, when she was working there, there were a chymograph and a time marker. Beatrice Edgell was particularly concerned with the precision of the instruments used in experimental studies. From 1906 to 1908, she conducted, in collaboration with Leg Science, a series of calibrations to determine the conditions and degree of accuracy in chronoscope readings, as was reported by the authors. The chronoscope readings were accurate for reaction times ranging from 3 milliseconds to 1 minute, and the mean error was less than 1 millisecond. The paper by Edgar and Symes was still cited 30 years later. Mental chronometry had to wait 50 years to be further improved when a new generation of technological devices became available. The chronoscope was also used to determine the strength of associative learning. The most substantial and innovative part of the experimental study of memory was conducted by Edgar on over a thousand children from eight to 12 years old in their schools. She presented a series of five cards showing pairs of stimuli, objects, numbers or geometrical figures for five seconds to each child. There was a clear increase in the percentage of correct associations with age. However, at the age of 12, boys were reporting more correct associations than girls and in some types of associations, the younger children obtained the best results. Edgell was a pioneer in the classification of different types of memory. In her words, experience is not merely retained, but reproduced with the consciousness that it belongs to the past. After her retirement, she worked at the Child Guidance Clinic in Gloucestershire and continued her active participation in professional associations. She died in Cheltenham on the 10th of August 1948. We arrive in Berlin in the laboratory for the anatomical study of the human brain established by Cecile and her husband Oscar Vogt, where they used the most advanced techniques of the time in histology specimens preparation. The neurobiological laboratory was at the beginning a private institution not involved in university teaching. From 1914, it was expanded to include the Casa Willem Institute for Brain Research that will later become the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research. Cecil Vogt's work on morphology of the nervous system contributed to a new understanding about the interaction of different regions of the brain. In 1924, she became co-editor of the German journal for psychology and neurology. In 1932, she was elected into the German Academy of Sciences Leopoldine et Halle, the highest academic distinction given by an institution in Germany. In 1950, she was awarded with the first class national prize of East Germany and became a member of the German Academy of Sciences at Berlin. Augustine Marie Cécile Mounier was born in Annecy, France, in 1875. Her parents never legally married, and she didn't know it until 1933, when the National Socialists requested her to prove her Aryan descent, and she was unable to provide a birth certificate. She began to study medicine in Paris at the age of 18. She was one of the first females admitted. The French neurologist Pierre-Marie offered her to work in his research team at the Bicetre Hospital. There, she met her future husband Oscar Vogt, a German scientist that was spending in Paris a period of time in the laboratory of Augusta and Jules Dagerin. Mugnier Vogt, before meeting Oscar, gave birth to a girl, Claire, which Oscar adopted after the marriage. They had two more daughters, 
Moth and Marguerite, both of whom became successful scientists. Mugnier Bogd started her doctorate in Paris, but then she moved to Berlin after getting married. There, she completed her work and earned a doctorate degree in 1900 for a dissertation in neuroanatomy. The proportion of women pursuing doctorates in medicine at the time was still only 6%. 30 years later, women were first admitted to medical studies. Her doctoral work was aimed to study the myelination in the cerebral hemispheres. She compared the brain myelination at early developmental age in different mammals and concluded that the myelination process appeared to be very similar in all the studied animals, in contrast with the dominant opinion that a human brain was fundamentally different from the animal one. In Berlin, Cecil Mugnier Vogt started to use the cortical electrical stimulation among very few other scientists in Europe, including Lord Sherrington in the UK. In her first paper on the mild architecture of the thalamus, she identified several nuclei of the thalamus and their connections. This was a groundbreaking work for the modern understanding of the physiology of the thalamus. Consistently with her interest in the functional correlates of neuroanatomical substrates, she used to correlate the patient's clinical diagnosis with the neuropathological findings. She focused on the lesions of the striatum as a cause of pseudobulbar palsy, and in some cases she examined brains belonging to members of the same family who died with this condition. This allowed her to make some assumptions on hereditary diseases that were very innovative and visionary for the time. Although Cecile Mugnier Vogt was greatly contributing to the scientific advancements in the centre directed by her husband, it was only between the years 1919 and 1937 that she held a formal paid position as a scientist at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. Cecile and Oscar Vogt worked with Corbin and Breitman in defining many such architectonic subdivisions of mammalian and human brain. The relationship between Breitman and the Vox was compromised after they published the first results on electrical excitability of cortical regions in 1907 without listing him as a co-author. Their approach to psychiatric disease was quite ahead of time. They believed that each psychiatric disease had a precise anatomical localization, meaning that it had biological basis, although not known yet. According to this idea, they became quite early very critical on the Freud's theories of psychoanalysis that were very in vogue at the time. The folks were very liberal, pacifist and truly really believed that science had to be cosmopolitan. They always hired their collaborators based on their capability rather than their nationality or religion. Despite the continuous threats by the National Socialists and false accusations by other scientists close to the new political establishment. After massive assaults from the National Socialists in the year after 1933, during which they were receiving threatening inspections and accusations, Cecile and Oscar left the institute in Berlin. From 1937, they continued their work at a privately financed Institute for Brain Research and General Biology at Neustrad near Freiburg in the Black Forest. The research institute was considerably smaller and with fewer resources than the institute in Berlin, but they managed to continue researches and host international scientists. After Oscar's death in 1959, Cecile went to live with her daughter Marth in Cambridge, England, and she died there in 1962. In Leipzig, in the first institute of experimental psychology established by Wilhelm Wundt, Anna Maria Berlina was accepted as doctoral student and she was the first and only woman to achieve the admission. Actually
Actually, all this was just a matter of chance and not my special merit. But thus, I became the first and I think the only woman who took her PhD under wound. The topic of our doctoral thesis was the judgment of objectivity and subjectivity of visual sensations. Mary Gorkin cited Anna Bolina's experimental study as a suggestion of the distinction between perception and imagination. Anna Maya Bolina published her research in three different languages, such as German, English, and Japanese, and she made distinguished contributions to experimental psychology and psychology of advertising. She was awarded the Lifetime Fellow of the International Council of Psychologists in 1963 and the Apollo Award, a great honor from the American Optomeric Association in 1971. The Faculty of Physics at the University of Göttingen established the Berliner Angewitter Awards Foundation that awards students graduating with outstanding diploma and doctoral work. Anna Maya was born on the 21st December 1888 in Halberstadt, province of Saxony, from Henriette and Israel, an entrepreneur who had a business specialized in women's fashion. She had three sisters, Ruth, Elizabeth and Gertrude. Her mother and sister Elizabeth were imprisoned in a concentration camp by the Nazis. Henriette was murdered in 1942 and Elizabeth managed to escape and emigrate in the United States. Maya studied medicine in Freiburg and in Berlin, where she attended the Institute of Psychology. In 1910, she married Siegfried Berliner and followed him to Leipzig. She obtained a doctoral degree in 1913 with Brunner and Wundt as secondary advisors. She was an extremely vigorous and reliable scientist as the words testify. In fact, she wrote, At that time, an experiment published by one of the laboratories would be immediately repeated by all the universities, and without an exact description of all the details, a critical evaluation would not have been possible. In 1913, she moved to Tokyo with her husband and was admitted as a student at the Imperial University. In 1914, the World War One broke out and her husband was interned in a camp for German war prisoners in Japan. She left Japan for the United States, where she studied psychology at the Berkeley University of California and later at the Columbia University, New York. In 1918, she published The Influence of Mental Work on the Mental Image. In two series of experiments, Maya Bellina determined the attributes of the memory image that were more disrupted by mental work. Moreover, Maya Bellina found that the mental image deteriorates with practice. In 1920, after her husband was released, she returned to Japan. During these Japanese years, she was a pioneer in a new field of psychology, supported by the massively growing industrialization, the psychology of advertising. In 1925, after the stabilization of the Weimar Republic, the Berliners returned to Germany. Anna was allowed to teach at the Psychological Institute of Leipzig, but in 1938, the couple escaped from Nazi Germany to the US. In the US, Maya Bellina was offered only temporary teaching appointments. It was not easy for a woman, a foreigner and a Jewish to obtain a tenured position at a university. Notwithstanding, she was one of the four most authorities on visual perception. Finally, in 1951, at the age of 63, after moving from the University of Chicago to the Pacific University, Forest Grove in Oregon, she became professor and head of the psychological laboratory. In a series of articles for the magazine Optometric Weekly, she developed new general rules to predict many of the classical optical illusions. Text and phobias were enriched by her drawings. 
She showed that the distortion of straight and curved lines in geometrical fields can be expressed by a general relation that was called by Alpen the Berlin Slow. The modern fashion in this subject is computer simulation of the visual illusions. So far, it is all hand waving. Anna Maya Berlina died on the 16th of May 1977 at the age of 88. She was murdered in her house during a robbery. We leave Leipzig and make our way to the last station of a trip, Padua. In Piazza Capitaniato, in the buildings of the School of Philosophy, the psychology laboratory rooms were crowded with students and researchers. The laboratory was founded by Vittorio Benossi in 1919, and in eight years it became one of the best equipped and productive laboratories in Italy. Silvia De Marchi began working in the laboratory as an undergraduate student. In a short life, she conducted relevant researches in perceptual psychophysics and forensic psychology. She was the first woman to obtain a degree in experimental psychology in Italy. The preliminary work for her thesis was read to the audience by Minuzzi at the 4th National Congress of Psychology in Florence in 1923 when the Marquis was an undergraduate student. Silvia Gilda Maria de Marchi was born on the 25th of February 1897 in Pavia by Rosa Borro and Luigi de Marchi, professor of physical geography. In 1902, the family moved to Padua where her father was appointed field professor. In 1919, she began to study philology, literature and history at the University of Padua and in 1920-21 she began to attend the Laboratory of Experimental Psychology. Her graduate thesis, defended in 1924, was the first from this psychology laboratory as stated in a lovely letter of congratulations from the staff. Her work was aimed at experimental foundations of forensic psychology. The Marchi urged the introduction of objective measures to assess the reliability of witnesses in the court. She hypothesized that a concordance of court decisions can be due to the observation of a fact as it actually happened, as well as the uniformity of reaction to certain events and a uniformity of memory errors. According to the Marchi, the respiratory diagnosis was more reliable than trusting witnesses based on subjective criteria. The inspiration-expiration ratio was introduced by Benussi in 1914 and was calculated on from the traces of a pneumograph. Tamaki claimed that, even if the breath amplitude could be deliberately modified by the subject, this would not alter significantly the respiratory curves. In other words, considering the value of a testimony in relation to the memory of a fact, we have reported some experiences to prove that memory is almost deceiving, and that an absolute persuasion is not an index of correspondence with reality. From October 1925, she was appointed voluntary assistant at the psychology laboratory, continuing after Benucci's death in 1927. From 1929 to 1932, she was interned at the Institute of Experimental Psychology under the direction of Cesare Musatti. She used the method of magnitude estimation before Lewis reached its own. A series of these experiments was published by Namarki in 1929. She showed the subjects different configuration of dots for a very short time to prevent that dots were counted and asked them to evaluate numerically the scene collectivity. In some cases, the subjects were overestimating the number of dots and in other cases, they were underestimating. The variations were subject-based. The overestimation or underestimation of real individual constants. De Marchi 
found that the mean value for overestimators and underestimators was nowhere near the real number of dots. And generalizing these findings, advised the judges to be careful in evaluating information from different witnesses in the courtroom. She observed the interactions between internal factors representing the awareness behavior of the subjects towards the stimuli, and external factors given by the objective conditions in which the stimuli were presented. As determinants for subject estimations, Silvia De Marchi conducted original and interesting experiments on forensic psychology, as well as on magnitude estimation, and they are worth to be recalled nowadays. In 1932, she married Cesare Musatti. They had one child, Riccardo. In 1935, she had a miscarriage due to infection and fever. She died a few months later of mastoiditis. These are the stories of seven women born in the 19th century who worked hard to become scientists and published pioneering works in their fields. These women have been largely forgotten and this is a journey in time and space to meet and remember them. It's time to get in. The train is ready to start another journey. Yeah. 